who look at the constellations in their own darkened heavens and see among them a star we call the sun and who, like us, wonder. Are we alone, alone, alone? <laughs> With an intro like that, this has to be cool. Welcome, folks, to our virtual nightlife here from the California Academy of Sciences team, but not actually at the California Academy of Sciences. We are beaming straight into your home. Now, nightlife often happens at the Academy on our Thursday evenings. We really wanted to recreate that while we're all sheltering in place, so we are piping it out to you. My name is Josh. I work in the Morrison Planetarium inside the California Academy of Sciences, and most nightlifes, you would find me inside the dome or up on our living roof with telescopes trying to share the cosmos with guests. But today we get to do something extra cool. We are doing a nightlife focused around astronomy. I've been looking at the chat. A lot of you seem to have astronomy as an absolute favorite subject. That's great. Astronomy is a wonderful science. It encompasses a huge amount of things, and it really inspires people towards science as a whole. So. Over the course of our evening, we're going to have a lot of special guests. I'm going to be popping in in between. And if you have any astronomy questions that are burning a hole in your frontal lobes, put them in the chat. I would take any suggestion you've got about something you want to know a little bit more about, something we like to call Ask an Astronomer. And for our special guests this evening, we are spanning a wide range of subjects, all under that umbrella of astronomy. First off, we'll be hearing from Mia de las Reyes for a galactic archaeology dig. Then we're going to be hearing from our own Bing Kwok telling us about what we can catch in tonight's sky. Mary Holt from the planetarium team as well will be telling us about the real deal behind astrology. And then Diana Powell telling us about baby exoplanets and how they were born. 
Mike Smale is going to be sharing us information about some cool astronomy vinyl he's collected. We're borrowing him from Adler Planetarium in Chicago for the evening. And then Bing is back to tell us about our own special broadcast you just heard called Vortex. Kind of an interesting piece of Morrison Planetarium history and an interesting sort of audiovisual collaboration between artists and scientists that happened at the Academy a long time ago. We'll be hearing from Connor Griebel as our final guest telling us about Vortex 2.0, kind of a rebirth of that same idea at the modern Morrison Planetarium. So again, if any of you folks have ideas or questions, something you want to know more about, please drop it in the chat. I would love to hear from you and we'll be popping back in to hear what you've got to say. So with that, thank you again for joining us. And I think we can start heading over to our very first guest. That would be Mia. Mia, are you ready? Hello, hi everyone. My name is Mia Delos Reyes. I'm doing my PhD in astronomy at Caltech. Uh, and as you might have guessed from looking at this screen, I don't know if you can, can you see the screen? The, okay, great, yes. So I got through most of the first couple years of my graduate classes by doodling in my notes. So I wanted to take you all with me on a doodle adventure today. And you might have guessed from the title uh, that I'm gonna be talking about archeology. span So just in case you hadn't guessed, this is me. I am a great artist, as I'm sure you can tell. And since we're talking about archeology, span let's put on our brown fedoras and start humming the Indiana Jones theme songs under our heads, because that's what I'm doing right now. So let's get started by talking about what actually archeology span is. So as unlike Indiana Jones might have led you to believe, it doesn't, whoop, it doesn't actually have anything to do with crystal skulls or you know temples of doom. It, it's really just the study of people in the past. So the way that we can study these people is by looking at the stuff that they make. So this is sort of a universal trait, I think, of a lot of humans. We make stuff. We make bowls. We make, I don't know, jewelry. Maybe some of us in this pandemic have been turning to sourdough bread making. We like making things. And then eventually the other truth about being human is that we all die. So it's a little depressing, but it's very true. Uh, but the great thing about being human is that even though you die, there are future generations to come after you and to build on all that stuff that you made. And so this is how we went from, you know, the stone age when we're making bowls and arrowheads out of stone to the bronze age when we learned how to use metal. This is how we got from the very first PCs to the smartphones that we have today. It's sort of the evolution of stuff and of people making things. And so what archeologists do for their job is they study the stuff that people make and then they use the stuff that people made in the past to learn about those people in the past, you know, what they did, where they lived, all that good stuff. And so at this point, you're probably wondering why I'm talking about archeology span at all because I'm not actually an archeologist, I'm an astronomer. So I'm a kind of astronomer called a galactic archeologist. So galactic archeology span is just a special field, subfield of astronomy, where instead of studying people as actual archeologists do, we study stars. Because stars, like people, stars make things. Throughout their lifetimes as they live and as they die, uh, stars don't make bowls or jewelry, they make heavy elements like helium, and iron and carbon and oxygen. The oxygen we breathe, the iron that's in our blood, all of those things came from inside stars. And then when stars die, some of them will go out pretty peacefully. So our sun, it'll sort of just shed, away, uh, shed its outer layers and sort of peacefully die. But other stars do go out with more explosive bangs, which we're gonna call supernovae. And when they die, they release all of those heavy elements that they've made back into the galaxy that they were born in, and then future generations of stars can incorporate those elements and use them to make new and different elements. So as a galactic archeologist, just like a normal archeologist, I study the stuff that gets made. I study what the stars made, uh, all these heavy elements here, and I use those to understand what happened to the stars in the past and how they lived and died. And so now that we sort of have a handle on what galactic archeology span is, let's go on an archeological dig of, of sorts. So archeological, it took me a very long time to learn how to write this word, so I hope you're proud of me. So let's go on our dig. Here's our intrepid archeologist uh, who has some kind of hair probably. And the reason it's called an archeological dig 
is because that's what you do, you actually dig. The artifacts that archeologists look for are underground or on the ground sometimes. And you know, they have shovels and they have brushes and they actually excavate the things that, uh, these artifacts and they analyze them. I have actually talked to a number of archeologists and geologists and they say that a lot of it involves licking things. So you find something and you sort of lick it <laughs> to figure out like what different materials are. But as a galactic archeologist, unfortunately, that option is not available to me. So we're studying stars, which unfortunately you can neither dig nor lick. And so your shovel is useless. The things in the ground are not very helpful to you. And instead, well, all we really have from these stars is the light coming from them. And so our goal is to, to collect as much light as possible from these stars. So we, we use telescopes to do that. In particular, the telescope I use is the Keck telescope, which is located on Mauna Kea, which is a sacred mountain in Hawaii. Um, and here is my attempt at drawing the Keck telescope. Hopefully they don't kick me out for this. Um, it's got a kind of a hexagonal mirror shape. And this is very much not to scale, I should, I should emphasize. So I'm maybe five feet tall, I'm, I'm very short, which is around one and a half meters. And the mirror in the Keck telescope is easily eight times my height. So 10 meters across. So this is very much not to scale. Please don't take this as you know, representative of actual uh, telescopes. But the reason we need such huge telescopes in the first place is because we really need to get as much light as possible from these stars. And then what do we do once we actually have that light? We need to actually get information from it. And fortunately for us, light comes in a lot of different colors. So every single light source that we see, uh, even you know from the sun, from light bulbs, almost all light sources give off light in multiple colors, even if it doesn't look like it at first. So I can actually prove that. So here is my own bedside lamp. And it looks like it's sort of giving off, you know, whitish yellow light. But if I put up my, these special glasses that show all the different colors, you can see the rainbow that's produced when you split all of the light into the colors that make it up. And so stars are like that too. Stars don't just give off one color of light. They give off this whole spectrum, this whole rainbow. Uh, but unlike the light that we just saw, it's not a perfect rainbow, unfortunately. So stars really only give off uh, light in certain colors. And in some colors, they don't give off much light at all. And that's because there are elements in the atmosphere of the star that are absorbing light at those specific colors. So for instance, hydrogen will give off, will, will absorb light at certain frequencies. Whoops, here we go around maybe this color uh, and here and here, this is sort of a very rough estimate, but all of these sort of black bands that we see when we split up the light are from hydrogen absorbing that light. And so this is all due to hydrogen. And this specific pattern of lines from hydrogen is, is it's unique. It's sort of a, a fingerprint that is only linked to hydrogen. So other elements, so for instance, sodium does not have this pattern of lines. Sodium produces a different pattern, uh, something that looks maybe more like this. It has two lines here, two pretty strong lines, and then I know it has a couple here. Uh, sodium's a lot more complicated. I don't know where all the lines are, but let's say something like that. Doesn't look anything like hydrogen. And so this is actually how we measure what stars are made of by looking at their light, splitting, up, splitting it up into colors and fingerprinting the individual elements that uh, absorb different parts of the light. So what do we do once we have measurements of all of these elements? One of the biggest questions that galactic archeologists try to answer is where these elements came from in the first place. So just like in normal archeology, span a lot of that is trying to study humans from the past to understand where humans today came from. And galactic archaeology is like a way more extreme version of that. So instead of just looking at humans in the past, we're looking at the building blocks of humans, of life, of the, of the earth, you know, the building blocks of the universe that make up everything. And so our main goal is something like this. So this is the periodic table of elements showing you know, all the natural chemical elements. These ones down here are man-made, so they don't show up. And our goal is to figure out where they all come from. And you can see we've, we've made some strides already to answering that question. So the different colors show where we were pretty sure a lot of these elements come from. So iron, for instance, is this element here. And based on its colors, you can tell that it was produced partly in exploding massive stars, so supermassive stars that when they die, gravity takes over and they end up collapsing and exploding on themselves. So stars that are much, much more massive than our sun. And then iron also comes from exploding white dwarfs. So exploding massive stars and exploding white dwarfs. Um, and white dwarfs are a kind of sort of a dead cold remnant when a star like our sun dies. So when, it, when our sun dies, it'll eventually turn into a white dwarf. And some of those white dwarfs will end up exploding in a different kind of supernova. 
And so iron, we think, comes from both of those sources. So you might look at this periodic table and think that, OK, well, we're done. We, we know where all of the elements come from. But a lot of this is still active areas of research. We haven't worked out a lot of the details of uh, several, where many of these elements come from. Um, and then we can also use those elements to figure out other things about our, uh, about our universe. So for instance, I study manganese. One could say I am a fanganese of manganese. Uh, and manganese is really interesting to me because it's mostly made in these explosions of white dwarfs. And we actually don't really understand how these white dwarfs explode. We don't know like how massive they have to be or how many white dwarfs they are. And so manganese can actually help us by helping us sort of distinguish between all these different models. We can measure the amount of manganese and then compare it to all of these different models that we have. And so just to sort of recap, the whole goal of galactic archaeology, it's based on this idea that stars make stuff. They make all these heavy elements, manganese, which is the best, uh, iron, I don't know, carbon, oxygen, et cetera. And then eventually, when these stars die, these elements get incorporated into the next generation of stars. So I really like this idea. I think it's just really cool to think about sort of stars having generations the way that we have generations. And I think I also like it because in a, in a super like meta kind of way, this is actually what we do as scientists. This is what I do. I am a person making up, you know, coming up with ideas and trying to expand human knowledge in my own way. And in particular, you know, maybe I do that by studying manganese and trying to understand how we go from these tiny white dwarf stars to these massive explosions. Right? It's a really small piece of sort of the human, the, the span of human knowledge. Um, but to me, it's really encouraging that, you know, this knowledge is not going to end with me. Like whenever I stop doing science, uh, there will be other people. And maybe some of those people are out there right now, some of these future scientists. And those future generations will take over and build on the ideas that, you know, uh, previous scientists have put down before. And so I, I just really like this idea. I think it's kind of a cute romantic idea. Um, and if you want to know more about what I particularly do, you can find me on Twitter at Mia Does Astro, where I sometimes talk, sometimes complain a little more about what I do. But I really enjoyed going on this galactic archaeological dig with you, and I hope you've learned something interesting. Thanks so much. The end. Thank you, Mia. That was a wonderful explanation of a really complex subject. I, too, am a fanganese of manganese now. Uh, but turning our eyes a little bit more towards a earthly perspective looking out, we have Bing Kwok, who is Assistant Director of Morrison Planetarium. How are you doing, Bing? Doing fine, Josh. How are you? And we have a night sky update for those folks at home, right? Yes, we do. Um, and one thing I want to mention, you know, you know that, that recording at the very beginning uh, that, that asked, are we alone? That was from the Morrison Planetarium Planetarium Lecture Series on LPs, which were produced back in the 60s. And that narrator was Hugh Bernhardt, and he did a number of those. Those are really cool. That was fun to hear. That was some dramatic uh, intro, <laughs> I will say. Well, Hugh had a great being. voice. Okay, well, um, what we one of the things that we do um, uh, online during this uh, period when we're working from home is we do a number of, of, of streams. One that we do on Thursdays at 1.30 is called uh, Night Sky Update. And I use a program called um, uh, Stellarium, which um, let's see if we can see it on the screen here. Uh, it's a desktop planetarium program, which uh, you can download for free. You can you can put it on your desktop plan uh, uh, computer. You can load it onto your your uh, mobile device as an app, or you can just play with the version online at the website that it comes from, Stellarium.org. But it's a great desktop planetarium that simulates what you see in the night sky, and this is a, a view of what we would see right now uh, at 7:19. Um, the sun hasn't quite set. But uh, we can move through time fairly quickly to show you what the sky would look like if it were clear. And here in San Francisco, where I am in San Francisco near Golden Gate Park, it's not very clear. But yeah, we don't uh, get the sky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when it's clear and uh, when we're back open again, when the museum is open, we can invite people up to the living roof to have a look at the night sky, to look at stars, constellations, the planets, the moon. And tonight, just after sunset, people would be able to see things like uh, the moon over in the south-southeast. 
It's called a, wa a waxing gibbous phase moon. And what that is, is just a little bit less than full. And it looks sort of like a, a football, some people would call it. Um, the, the word gibbous means humpbacked. And so we see the, the moon sort of has a hump here. It's a little bit less than full, but you've got a really good view of the Mario, the dark patches and the bright highlands where a lot of the craters are. Next to that, you also have a couple of planets. You've got Jupiter or, and Saturn right here next to each other. And the moon is gonna move closer and closer to these planets in the next couple of nights. So Jupiter is a fascinating planet, which you can look at. And uh, it's uh, of course a planet that has a whole lot of moons. You can see the disk of the planet through binoculars. You can see three or four of the largest moons uh, of which there are 79 in all. And now, then when you next- say disk of the planet, what do you mean? Well, when you look at a star in the night sky, you see a tiny, tiny pinpoint of light. And that's the best we can see of most stars without special equipment because stars are so far away, we can't see their diameters. But with a pair of binoculars or a telescope, when you look at a planet, which is a lot closer to us, it has a, a, an apparent disk, an apparent diameter. You can actually see the width of the disk. And if you look carefully at Jupiter, you might be able to make out the dark bands across its face. Those are belts of clouds in its atmosphere. So, so the disk- technical language, more of a dot than a point? Yeah a dot instead of a point, instead of a, a pinpoint. Um, but the, the moons will look like tiny pinpoints compared to the disk of the planet. So thanks for clarifying that. Uh, and the next planet uh, out from uh, Jupiter is Saturn, which through a small telescope is a fascinating sight. You can see the rings of the planet. Uh, you need a really powerful telescope to see the planet well, the, the way spacecraft have, or the way the Hubble Space Telescope can see it. But Saturn has 82 moons, so imagine the sight of 82 moons in your sky. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that people have been really, really interested in lately is this thing called Comet Neowise. It uh, was discovered only in March, and uh, it surprised people. It, it became bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. I was able to see it in the morning sky. Now that it has moved into the evening sky, it's starting to fade away because it's moving away from Earth now. But uh, if you want to try seeing it tonight from wherever you are, if it's clear, look um, toward the northwestern part of the sky, just below the Big Dipper. So right under the handle of the Big Dipper, start from the, the star at the end of the handle, and then go straight down to the next brightest star just below the arc of the handle and continue that distance about almost the same uh, distance and you'll you'll come to comet neowise now you have to be in a really dark location to see it well you might need to use a pair of binoculars uh, but uh, a number of people have been able to see it. Uh, it is now getting faint, but you've probably seen a lot of spectacular photographs of it in the past uh, couple of weeks or so. Remember, yeah. though, those are time exposures, so they make things look a lot better than they do to the unaided eye. But uh, that's our last chance to see Comet Neowise for about the next 7,000 years, because that's Don't the length of its period. Yeah. And, and right now, the moon, as it gets fuller and fuller, is getting brighter. So its light is going to interfere with our view. So um, this is our chance right now to say goodbye to Neowise for, uh, for a little while. But those are a couple of the things in the night sky that we can see. And um, th that's one of the things that we do with our online streams. Uh, on Thursdays, we do a night sky update. On Tuesdays, we do a show for kids, kindergarten and pre-K. That's done by Mary Holt, who's coming up next or, or pretty soon. Uh, Very soon. Josh, you do a presentation on Wednesdays about uh, the, a tour of the solar system. Tomorrow, we've got a cosmic conversation where we're talking with one of the engineers of the human landing systems for the uh, Artemis project. So that's the follow-up to Apollo, which is going to land the next humans on the surface of the moon. So we're going to talk with Logan Kennedy. That's going to be a really exciting presentation. And I hope everyone has a chance to tune in and, and have a look and find out about Project Artemis. Fantastic. So, Bing, you've given some great suggestions for a hypothetical person that might be stuck at home and bored and have access to binoculars. I hope that some people out there get a chance to take advantage of it. But you mentioned Mary Holt, and Mary Holt is backstage right now and about to tell us about the real deal for astrology. So let's head over to her. Thank you, Bing. Sure.
All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mary Holtz. And as that wonderful introduction from Bing and Josh just told you, I uh, also work at the California Academy of Sciences and normally work in the planetarium with Josh and with Bing, uh, giving shows in our gigantic dome. But unfortunately, we're all stuck at home right now. But we've been fortunate enough to bring you some online programming during that. And today, since we were going to do a space themed nightlife, we were tossing around ideas of what to do. And one of the ideas was to talk a little bit about astrology and zodiac signs. And I got excited because that's one of the questions I get fairly often when we do a night sky uh, tour is what is my zodiac sign? And I always take a little bit of sick pleasure when I tell someone what their zodiac sign and it's totally different from what they thought it was. So <laughs> I'm gonna do a little bit of that today. We're not gonna get super in depth on any astrology topics since I do only have 10 minutes, but I am going to show you a couple of things that you can look for in the sky and some of the kind of factual things behind uh, the Zodiac. So uh, Bing just gave a wonderful intro to the software I'm using right now. I'm using Stellarium as well. I'm looking towards the south right now. There's the moon to our left. I've got the time and date thing down here just because I find that helpful to be able to keep track of what time we're looking at. And we can see the sun over in the west. And I'm gonna move us forward in time just a few hours so we can see the stars coming out. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the zodiac. So what is the zodiac first of all? Well, first we need to talk about what is a constellation. So constellations are areas in the sky that have particular groups of stars. Um, and a lot of times those stars have particular shapes um, or figures that we can look for. And we're going to be focusing today on the group of constellations that make up the zodiac. Now I am showing you a very narrow subset of all the different types of uh, constellations and shapes in the sky that you can look for. These particular ones, these are the Western ancient Greek uh, constellations that we use for the zodiac, which are often used here in the United States too. So if we look around, you might see some familiar, uh, some familiar characters over to the east. We've got Aquarius, Capricorn, Sagittarius, Scorpius, Libra, uh, Virgo over there. And the reason that these are grouped together, you may start to be able to see, they look like they're kind of lining up here. And at certain times, they'll look like they're making an arc across the sky. And that's because these zodiac constellations, they all lie along what we call the ecliptic. So this yellow line that I've brought up here is the path that the sun takes throughout the year. So at particular times of year, the sun will always be along this path. And you may notice our uh, planets that Bing pointed out, Saturn and Jupiter and the moon, they all lie along the ecliptic as well, which has to do with the fact that our solar system is a very flat uh, plane. So then if this is the zodiac, the zodiac are based on where the sun appears in the sky throughout the year. What does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with our birthdays or when we were born? Well, for that, I do have to go back in time a little bit because your zodiac sign, that is your sign for your birthday, is based on where the sun was on your birthday. So we're looking here at today, July 30th, and right now the sun is very obviously right smack in the middle of Cancer the Crab. Now, if you have your birthday around now or recently, that might be surprising. You might be like, wait, no, that's not my sign. That's incorrect. If I Google my zodiac sign for my birthday, that's not what comes up. What's going on? Well, this is because the zodiac that we often use has been wrong <laughs> for a very, very long time, which is one thing that makes me skeptical about the whole astrology deal in the first place. But let me just tell you about why that is. I'm going to use our little friend here to illustrate why this has happened. So hopefully we all know that the earth is rotating. That's why we have day and night every single day is because the earth is constantly rotating. You may also know that it's rotating around its axis, which is this imaginary line from the north to the south pole, which are my index fingers here. But something a little less well known is that that axis is tilted a little bit relative to the sun by about 23 degrees. But even less well known is that that tilt does not always point the same direction. Over a very, very long time period, 
it wobbles like a top kind of. And because of that wobbling, it's not the stars changing, it's not the constellations changing, it's us changing, making what we see at particular times of year change. So when the ancient Greeks came up with these constellations over 2000 years ago, the sun was in a different place. Let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna go back 2000 years, which is a bit after when these constellations uh, would have been invented, uh, but you know, still gives us a good idea. And going back 2000 years, you can see that the sun is very clearly in Leo, not in Cancer the Crab. So a lot of the zodiac signs uh, that we use today are based on that old system. It didn't keep up with this wobbling of the earth. So I, I hope I'm not breaking any hearts and telling you how you've been lied to your whole life. Uh, but I think it's a fun thing to learn about what, why exactly we use the things that we do. Um, but also, you may be thinking, if you're into astrology at all, uh, you may be thinking, well, that's not a big deal. The biggest deal is not the stars or uh, the constellations, but the planets have a lot to do with it too. And so with the couple minutes that I have here, I'm going to address at least one part of that. Again, I'm not gonna dive into a lot of nuances that have to do with astrology, because for one thing, that's just not part of what uh, I do, since I focus mostly on science, work at the Academy of Sciences, and astrology doesn't really fall under science anymore. Way, way back uh, when astronomy was a new science, astrology and astronomy were kind of one and the same. They were roughly the same thing, but they diverged quite a long time ago. And today, astrology is kind of in the beliefs realm and astronomy verged off into the science realm. So not that one is bad and one is good, but astrology isn't exactly uh, science anymore. But one thing that is science is one concept from astrology, which is uh, retrograde. So often when I hear people talking about uh, astrology and zodiac, they talk about Mars being in retrograde or Mercury being in retrograde. But often when I talk to people about that, they're not quite sure what exactly that means. So I'm going to show you a, cute, a cool little uh, calculation I can do with Stellarium. I had to look up what ephemeris is. It's just a, a chart of the location of an object in the sky over time. And I've set up our ephemeris here for Mars to show us where Mars's path is over several months. So Mars, a few months ago, back in June, would have been open. Oh, I'm still in the year 20, so let's go to 2020. There we go. So now we're in modern day. There's Mars. So Mars, um, back in June, was over here, and it's been moving along steadily towards the east as the weeks and the months have gone on. Right now it's over here. But something interesting will happen in just a few weeks where Mars will slow down. It'll reverse its course for a bit. It'll slow down again, and it'll keep on going the same direction it was going before. And this is what we call retrograde motion. And all that's happening here is just the fact that Mars and the Earth are going around the sun and they're going around the sun at different speeds. We're going around faster than Mars. So on occasion, just like if you were driving in a car and you were going slightly faster than another car and you pass them and as you approach them, they look like they're coming towards you. But as you leave them, they look like they're going away. A similar thing happens when we approach Mars. We get close to it in our orbit and then we pass it as we go a little bit faster. And Mercury does a similar thing, except Mercury is going way faster than us. It takes about 88 days for Mercury to go around the sun once. So it's in retrograde pretty often, which is probably why we hear about it a lot. Uh, but that's uh, pretty much all I've got for our presentation here. We are interested if you have any questions. I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have or if there are any leftover questions that we can't get to. I'm sure Josh uh, can address those later in the program. Uh, Ooh, Mary, we got some good ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we had a question from Neosiris13 asking about a rising sign. Is that a term you're familiar with? Very vaguely. I'm not super familiar with that, but I do know that there are rising signs. I know there are different signs for your for the different planets and the moon. Um, I can only assume that your rising sign is whatever constellation the sun would have been in uh, the day the sun was rising on your birthday. I could be wrong about that, but that's what I would assume that means. I did a quick Google and it looks mm -hmm. like at the moment of your birth, which constellation was coming up? 
There you go. So that's so a constellation getting, coming yeah. into the sky at the exact moment you're born. And hopefully they're using an up-to-date table for that. Yeah. Another really cool question we had from uh, Adrian was how long do we have to wait for us to wobble all the way back around for our stars to be back in the same positions as they were when this table was correct? Ooh, that's a good question. So these tables would have started roughly 2000 years ago, a little bit more, I think. Uh, and the whole, per the what's called precession, that's that wobble, takes, oh, I looked it up earlier and I hope I'm getting the number it's right. 26,000 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, roughly 26,000 years. So I would say what, it's gonna be another 14,000 years until they're correct 24, again? 24,000 years. Because we would have to go all the way back. All the way back around. Yeah. The cycle. So, yeah. so don't hold your breath. It's going to be <laughs> even longer than Comet Neowise. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. That was super cool. Glad you uh, any other questions coming in? I'm looking around. Oh, people want to know about the program Stellarium. How did hmm. you discover Stellarium, Mary? Oh, that's a very good question. So I've been working in planetariums for almost 10 years now. And I definitely remember using Stellarium and hearing about Stellarium even early on um, when I was doing this stuff. So it's been around for a while. And it's just a really good go to for for stuff like this, for looking at what's in the sky right now, for jumping back and forth in time and seeing what's in the night sky. And it's free, which is amazing. I was about to say, the price is right. So if you yeah. folks want to check it out at home, you can download it and play with it yourselves. It is super cool. Mm -hmm. OK, so thank you again, Mary, for sharing the skies with us. Have a wonderful rest of your night. You too. And we had a couple questions coming in from the chat that I wanted to circle back to really quickly. Monique asked, when is our next meteor shower? And I will say, Monique, a terrible response. Depends on what you call a meteor shower, because we are currently inside a very famous one called the Perseids. That's right. Right now is a meteor shower. I can't see it because my sky is 100% gray. But if you went outside, you might expect a couple more meteors than an average evening. What you might be looking for, though, is the peak of the Perseids, which, according to my post-it, is August 11th through 12th. If you folks are interested in this, check out the Morrison Facebook page. You can actually download our almanac, and you can have all of our upcoming meteor showers, as well as planet rising times for different times of year. It is a great resource for any sky watchers. Check out the Morrison page. I think we can probably get a link in the comments. Another question from Catherine was about this super cool launch that happened this morning. We have sent a brand new rover to Mars that is Perseverance. Now, Perseverance blasted off early this morning and has been traveling to Mars and hit an immediate hiccup. It turns out it launched into Earth's shadow, got a little cold, sent a standby notification that it was operating in safe mode, and everyone at NASA had a nice deep breath, chewed on their nails a bit. They're pretty sure it's going to be just fine. The mission is continuing. It's got some cool stuff on board, including an aerial drone, which I'm thinking might be the first time human beings fly something on another planet, because it's the first time we're landing on a planet with an atmosphere and something with wings to go check it out. It's also bringing a little piece of Mars back to Mars. I believe there are Martian meteorites on board Perseverance, so we're returning those bits of Mars to Mars, sort of repatriating those little tiny chunks of rock that left as meteorites long ago. But I don't want to take too much time. We have a jam-packed schedule this evening, and we will be switching over to Diana Powell from UCSC telling us about baby exoplanets. Diana, take it away. Am I going now? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Powell, and I'm a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. And right now I'm broadcasting to you near the Redwood Forest here. And I'm really happy to be here with you virtually tonight. So I decided that I wanted to study the universe when I was in the third grade and did a school project on stars. And since then, I've just been completely fascinated by the universe and with our connection to it. And for the past few years, I've been studying how planets form and what their characteristics are once they become planets. So I'm a theorist, but today I will be showing you some awesome observations that we have of planet formation processes taking place from beginning to end. But before we talk about other planets, let's start by taking a look at our home. So all of the material that made us came from this planet. So how did we get here? How, when, and where did the Earth form? 
Why do we have oceans and other characteristics that make us uniquely Earth and other planets don't? However, the Earth is 4 billion years old. And though we have some clues as to how it formed, it would be useful to have something a little younger to learn from. And so in the not too distant past, planets were thought to be very rare because we had no obvious ideas about how or where they formed. So even though we lived on a planet, we didn't know how many others existed. But luckily, we now know that many, many planets exist outside of our solar system. And this is great because we can use this information to learn so much more about how planets form. So right now, there are 4,197 planets, exoplanets, outside of our solar system that we know exist. And more are being discovered all of the time. And our current estimates uh, think that for every star in our galaxy, it hosts on average three planets. So there are billions of stars in the galaxy, three planets per star, that's a lot of planets. And so this is where astrophysics comes in handy. We can use this large sample size to learn a lot about a lot of things, including planet formation. Okay. So let's start at the beginning of planet and star formation. So before planets and stars were planets and stars, they were parts of molecular clouds. So these are, are giant bunches of gas and dust in the universe. Here I'm showing the Horsehead Nebula. It's one of the most famous pictures in astrophysics, and it shows an area of active star formation. However, the Horsehead Nebula is really large, so 3.5 light years across. It's huge. So if we want to look at something that maybe was something similar to what the Earth and our Sun looked like before we were the Earth and the Sun, if we can look at one of my favorite images in the history of astrophysics ever, which is this picture of Barnard 68. So it might be confusing that I love this picture of this black smudge against the starry sky so much. And I do, I really like the black smudge. And that's because this black smudge is a cloud of gas and dust that looks about the right size and temperature and mass to soon form a solar system, maybe like our own. So any day now in cosmic time, this could collapse. And once this cloud collapses, a star is born. And so um, up until this point, I've been showing you actual images. This is an artist's visualization, though, of what a star might look like shortly after it's born. But for most of the talk, I'll be showing real pictures. So when it's not a picture of something that we've taken with a telescope, I'll show you, I'll tell you that it's an artist's visualization. And so a star is born, and stars are great. But at the same time that a star is born, a disk is born. And I care a lot about these disks around stars because that's where planets form. So if we were to show where proto-Earth would be on this picture, we might have been somewhere like here when we were forming the Earth. So somewhere in this disk close to our star. But planets can form throughout this picture, we think. And so it's important to understand this disk from a lot of different perspectives. So this disk around a newborn baby star. Okay, so what, what is this disk? Here I'm showing another artist visualization with a little inset of what it might look like if you could zoom in to millimeter to centimeter scales on this protoplanetary disk. So when I say protoplanetary, I mean it's either forming planets or it's hosting planets. And it's mostly composed of gas and dust. So here you can see dust orbiting around in the presence of gas. And if you look closely, hopefully you can see the ice is also forming on these dust grains. So small dust, ice, gas, it's all the building blocks of planets. And these are really giant things. So if we were to put, if this is one of the biggest protoplanetary disks in the sky. If we put our solar system on this picture, it would fill up this region. So all the way out to the orbit of Neptune. But notice that this protoplanetary disk is huge. So it can be 10 times larger than the orbit of Neptune. So really big systems that could form a variety of different planets. Okay. So we've been looking at artist visualizations, but we're really lucky to be alive now because we don't have to rely on artist visualizations of what we think might be happening. We can look at pictures directly. So here I'm going to show you the first pictures that we've taken of protoplanetary disks. To do this, we use the Hubble Space Telescope. 
um, which is still an awesome telescope for uh, all areas of astrophysics. And the Hubble Space Telescope looked at the Orion Nebula and saw these four images. So I'll zoom in a bit on these. And here in the Orion Nebula, you can see four stars, so four bright spots, surrounded by these black smudges. And so these black smudges are protoplanetary disks surrounding these young baby stars. And so the next time you look at the Orion Nebula, think about these little smudges and know that the stars that are forming there also form disks, and those disks are forming planets. But we're even more lucky to be alive now because we don't have to rely on just Hubble images to look at these forming systems. We can now use modern space, well, ground telescopes, like here, the ALMA Observatory in Chile, that can take pictures of disks in unprecedented resolution. So here I'm showing you a real image of a protoplanetary disk. This is not an artist visualization. This is a real disk, a real system out there. So we can see substructure, we can see rings, we can see brightness variations. We can look directly at these objects that are the birthplaces of planets. And something that I personally love, so we're looking at this giant protoplanetary disk, but what we're actually seeing all the, are the small dust grains present in the disk. That's the light that we're looking at, the light re-emitted from these small grains. So the next time you run into a millimeter to centimeter sized dust particle, like you go to the beach and you're hanging out in sand, Think about how those small dust grains are the building blocks that form planets like the Earth. So that's where we started from. And we're lucky because we don't have to just look at one disk in high resolution. We can do this for many disks now. So here I'm showing a sample of disks. Again, we're looking at the dust. So this is a lot of dust. Uh, and we're looking at lots of different disks in really high detail. And you can see different shapes here. So I hope it's big enough that you can see there are spiral arms, there are circles and, um, well, gaps and rings. And as a theorist, looking at images like this makes me really excited and happy because there's so much complexity and detail between the different systems that I know I'll be in a job for a while longer. So there's a lot to explain. And we're lucky again, because we don't have to just look at the dust, which is a part of these systems, but it's not the only component. We can also look at the gas. So here I'm looking at carbon monoxide gas in these protoplanetary disks. These are two of my favorite. I'll tell you the telephone numbers because they're my favorite disks. AS209, HD163, 296, really awesome systems. And here we're looking at carbon monoxide gas. So most of the gas in these systems is hydrogen gas, but the carbon monoxide is also important and it tells us what the gas is doing. And both components are important when we're forming planets. So we want to know what they're made of and what kind of planet they eventually become. And we can also look at the same disk from different ways. So here I'm showing different pictures of the same disk. And I'm looking at different uh, stiff particle sizes. So it might be weird to see me get so excited about dust, but I really am. Because here you can see on the left, we're looking at big dust grains. And the disk looks really small. And then for the same disk on the right, we're looking at small dust grains and the disk looks really big. And so <laughs> this might uh, seem like just a, a fun little fact, but this is actually telling us a lot about these systems. And so in my research, I've used these observations to learn a lot about protoplanetary disks and what they can tell us about planet formation. And in particular for this system and for others like it, I've learned through these observations that these disks have a lot of mass, so a lot of stuff. And it might seem really obvious um, that we could look at these pictures and see how much mass is in the system, so how much stuff is there, but it's actually really hard. And so we need to use these really interesting ways of looking at protoplanetary disks to see how much total stuff is there, how much gas, how much dust. And in my research, we found that there's a lot of stuff, um, enough stuff to make a lot of planets which is really exciting because we know there are a lot of planets and they had to come from somewhere. And this, this helps us bring resolution to some of our theories about how planets form and evolve. And so this is one of the most blind, mind blowing discoveries that's come out in my time as a professional astrophysicist. And that is that we don't have to just look directly at protoplanetary disks themselves and try to infer things about planet formation. 
but we can also now see planets forming in real time. So here I'm showing a picture of a disk taken by my friend Steph Salen, where you can see these multicolored smudges. Two of them are pretty clear, and maybe you believe the third smudge, I think I do. And what these smudges are, are planets that are forming in the disk. And the multicolors tell us that they're actively growing, they're actively pulling mass from the large protoplanetary disk itself onto the planets. So these are growing baby planets that we're looking at in real time. Crazy. And we don't just have one system that we can look at in this way. Here I'm showing another system that's more and more recently discovered, PDS-70, where you can see these nice white arrows point to two forming planets in the disk. And I think, so this is still a, a real, a real um, picture, not a visualization. So this is amazing that we can look at these planets. But then we can also imagine what this might look like if we could see even deeper. So here I'm showing an artist's visualization of what might be happening, where there are two planets forming in a gap, and they're creating this gap in the major protoplanetary disk because they're funneling material onto themselves. So they're growing and forming and becoming big planets. Okay, so this is awesome, but we can still do more. So here, I'll, I'll take some time to walk through what this is. This is still an image. So this is an image of a protoplanetary, of an exoplanet system. So I'm going to play the movie soon, but you can see these four bright dots. Those are planets that we're looking at directly. So we're not looking at anything. Um, we're not using, well, we're using a special technique, but we're looking directly at these planets with a telescope. And the center is the host star that I've blocked out or has been blocked out in this picture with a filter. And so now we can see these planets rotating around their star. So this is a movie of what's actually happening. We're taking movies of other solar systems. <laughs> and we know that these are hot young planets because the telescopes that we have now can only reach, um, uh, can only take observations of planets that are really hot and really young because that also means they're really bright. So these hot young planets in another solar system can now be imaged directly. We can take movies and we can learn about one endpoint of planet formation. So we can go all the way from the molecular clouds to these hot young fully formed planets. And then the next step in planet evolution is something like our fully mature solar system. So that's what you can see here. Actually, I'm just kidding. If you're looking at this closely, this is not our solar system at all. These are nonsense planets. And I just find this picture really funny. But we can end up at our fully mature solar system. This is the real one. And I think I have just a little bit of time left. So I'll say not only can the final end of planet formation look like our solar system, but it can also look like solar systems that are very different from ours. And so here in the bottom, I'm showing our inner solar system. So you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. I like to think of Mercury as being pretty close to our sun. But if we look at this enlarged other solar system on the top, here's the TRAPPIST-1 system which you may have heard about because it has seven rocky planets that maybe are Earth-sized, and some of them maybe even host life. It's, it's possible. <laughs> um, and all of these planets and all seven, all seven planets, all seven of their orbits could fit inside the orbit of Mercury. So this is a, an example of a stellar system outside of ours that is very different. So we know that planet formation, we already know that the disks look very interesting and we know that the solar systems themselves look different and interesting as well. And so I'm really excited to be working on this field right now and to be sharing these results with you. It's a great time to be alive if you wanna learn about planets and how they form and evolve. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Diana. That was absolutely awesome. Uh, I can feel my boss psychically willing me. We've got a planetarium show coming out called Big Astronomy and not too long. I hope you can catch it, Diana, because I think you'd be a fan of some of the visualizations we have in there. But I hope everybody can catch it because we're talking a lot about this same stuff. And it sounds like you folks are very interested in it. We had a couple questions come in and you should pose these to Diana on her Twitter feed right after this, but I'm going to do my best take on them. How fast does stuff have to be rotating to form a planet? It's a question Shapiro asked. Turns out probably not that fast. 
uh, the particles within there, it's the difference in motion that you'd really want to get stuff bumping into each other and sticking together to get larger, to gather up more stuff, to get bigger. There's a runaway process that happens there. But if stuff's spinning too fast, it would gain and travel farther from the star. If it's spinning too slow, it'd probably get too close to the star. So not too fast, not too slow, just right. And we had another question coming in from Stir, or Rooster. I hope I pronounced that right. What is space dust made of? Remember Mia's presentation? That whole periodic table? That's the leftovers of stars. Some of it lasts longer than others, but dust could really be made of any of it. Basically, if you look at what Earth is made of, all of those particles were tiny grains at some point, and Earth coalesced from them. We might have gathered our water from some other parts of our solar system, which is still kind of an outstanding question. But when we look at that, what Earth is made of was all dust. So I think we've taken enough time. We are going to jump over actually bringing in an expert from another planetarium, which is super exciting for us. The great Adler Planetarium of Chicago has loaned us their one and only Mike Smale. He is the director of theaters and has a much longer title. I'm not going to try and struggle through, but Mike, are you there? Hey, Josh. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, my name is Mike Smale. I'm from the Adler in Chicago, and we're going to spend the next 10 minutes or so diving into the history of planetarium show musics and, music and soundtracks uh, as represented in my record collection. So it should be fun and interesting. You might have wondered you know, how do planetariums come up with music when they make new shows like the big astronomy show Josh just mentioned or our productions. And it this day and age is not too dissimilar from a Hollywood process. You hire a composer, you have somebody mix and edit and master and do all that, but uh, it hasn't always been that way. For example, back in the mid 90s, there was a pretty popular planetarium show about black holes. And to come up with music and sound effects for that show, uh, they did a little bit of their own music, but they also lifted quite a bit of music and sound effects from the Disney black hole film from 1979. I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations is passed on this one, but don't tell the mouse just to be safe. Prior to that, a lot of planetariums did have larger staffs and quite a few planetariums that did their own productions did have their own musicians or composers in residence at their planetarium. A couple such examples of that. First up, the Fisk Planetarium in Boulder, Colorado. A guy named Mark Peterson was their composer in residence and he started releasing music from their planetarium show soundtracks under the, uh, the nom de plume geodesium. And this is the uh, the cover. The first two geodesium records actually exist on vinyl. Double Eclipse was the second one. The self-titled was the first. If you're looking at that self-titled record and you're wondering why is Epcot on there, uh, this is not the geodesic dome on top of Spaceship Earth at Epcot. This is the geodesic dome on top of the Fisk Planetarium in Boulder, Colorado. They also lifted some kind of laser effects from inside the planetarium for the cover. The, uh, the first geodesium record came out in 1977, and it's it's got an almost kind of like proto chiptunes vibe to it. Uh, if you like chiptunes, you might, it's kind of surprisingly easy to listen to. Uh, the second record and then all the ones following, uh, he's still releasing music, have a much more sort of uh, synthy, new agey space music vibe. Uh, and then of course they've all got, you can actually see there's a picture of Mark working in his, uh, his station back in 77. And the songs have great titles like Little Dipper and Star Death and Ptolemy's Tune and fun things like that. So that was late 70s, early 80s. The first planetarium composer in residence was a guy named Tim Clark. He was at the Strasenberg Planetarium in Rochester, New York. And this is a vinyl pressing of a show they did called The Last Question. Now, if any of you are sci-fi buffs, you might recognize that title. It's an Isaac Asimov short story that was adapted for planetarium. Uh, Leonard Nimoy actually did the narration. And Tim Clark, the in-house composer, performed the entire, uh, the entire soundtrack, the entire score on Moog synthesizers. In fact, if you were here at the very, very beginning of the broadcast, the little kind of two, three minutes of computer music that played right before the session started, that was the intro track from this record. And it was actually designed to play as audiences were coming into the theater, sitting down, finding their seat before the show. The, uh, the last question, the geodesium records of it been pretty hard to come by. Uh, they've been sold out for quite a while. Occasionally, you'll find them pop up in the secondary market on eBay, Discogs, things like that. Uh, but they're far from the first example of planetarium music. If we go even further back, we come to something that Bing hinted at a little bit early on, earlier on. 
And that was a series of records called the Planetarium Lecture Series put out by the Morrison Planetarium in San Francisco. This is the, the first record, Life Among the Stars. If you look up there in the corner, you'll see a little Stellar Ventures uh, sort of inlay vanity label that was created, and then an Optica Company sticker. Uh, Optica was a company in Oakland. They sold like telescopes and binoculars and lens accessories. Uh, I looked up their address. They're not there anymore. It's a, it's a coffee shop. Um, but to talk a little bit more about these, these uh, records, a planetarium lecture series is not really the sexiest title to sell a record by, right? Um, and uh, I want to just read the description of the lecture series to you off the back of the record here. So the planetarium lecture series is an attempt to bring the thrill and intellectual stimulation of planetarium lectures into the home and classroom through dramatic recorded adaptations of the kinds of programs currently offered in planetariums everywhere. That doesn't sound that much better, but uh, let's jump over to my slides and I'll talk a little bit about this planetarium lecture series. So this guy right here is Hubert J. Bernard, uh, no relation or alleged inspiration to Hubert J. Farnsworth, for those of you who are Futurama fans, although I strongly doubt that. Uh, Hubert J. Bernard was a lecturer at the Morrison Planetarium. He presented, again, the presentations, the shows they referred to as lectures uh, in that time, for uh, upwards of 20 years, from the 50s uh, up into the 70s. He also worked as a, a copy editor and a reporter at the San Francisco Examiner, a local newspaper. And he, he crafted what he described as his hit presentation style. Uh, it was combining the sort of expert astronomy knowledge along with an enthusiasm for the topic, and then that sort of dogged focus reporter's determination to get all the details just right. So if we jump through, so the first one in the series is a series of five records. Uh, and I wanna play a little sound clip for you because when you see the, the topics of each of these lectures, I think what made these so kind of remarkable and so accessible is they weren't boring lectures. They weren't just hard science talks. They brought in cultural references, religion, uh, science fiction. Uh, in fact, you know, we just heard about exoplanets. And I want to play a little clip for you from this first release in 1966, uh, which the first exoplanets weren't discovered until the 1990s. And uh, in this clip, they theorize about finding exoplanets. The sun is an average star in most respects. If our average star has a system of planets, why shouldn't others? They all came into being, presumably, in about the same way. It seems reasonable to suppose that the process that gave birth to the Earth and its neighbors was a normal, natural one. Exactly, and we now know that's the case. There are thousands of other planets we've discovered orbiting other stars behind our own. Uh, and then uh, also, as Bing mentioned, the clip, the Are We Alone, that we kicked off Nightlife with, that was the sort of cliffhanger end music at the very end of this particular show. Uh, last thing to note, you can also see the original Morrison uh, Planetarium projector, the original Academy projector they built uh, there behind Hubert. The, uh, the second record came out also in 1966. It was the Christmas Star. It was a look at, um, <clears throat> it's a popular planetarium show topic around the holidays, sci possible scientific explanations for the Star of Bethlehem. The third record came out in 1967 and it was about the UFOs. It was about UFOs and sightings and astronomers like Clyde Tombaugh who claimed to have seen, uh, who had claimed to seen these UFOs. Uh, the best part of that record is that Hubert Bernard pronounces them UFOs. He doesn't say UFOs, he says UFOs the whole time. And I've never heard anybody else say that, and it's great. The fourth record in the series also came out in 1967, Mysteries of Mars. Again, this was several years before we landed on Mars for the first time. So there was still a lot of speculation and things we didn't know about the planet that were included in that presentation. Uh, and then the last one, The Other Moons, came out in 1970. Quick shout out to Dan Tell of Cal Academy for sending me a picture of his copy because I actually don't own that one. Uh, but this one, again, started with the Earth's moon and then progressed out to look at other moons in our solar system. And then, again, got out into the realms of science fiction, even positing the idea of a distant moon that maybe could be an alien space station. If that idea sounds familiar to you, it's because Obi-Wan Kenobi dropped it about seven years later in Star Wars. That's about it for the slides. Sorry, we'll jump back here. 
And uh, again, these are um, these records. Again, I've got four of the five. They're not they're not that hard to find. There's several of them on eBay right now. There's listings for them on Discogs, which is a record cataloging site, uh, and they can be generally found pretty easily. But what a lot of people don't know is that this was not the only Planetarium lecture series. Morrison Planetarium released, or at least started to release, a second Planetarium lecture series. And this Planetarium lecture series was focused on the Zodiac. So this particular record is about the constellation Taurus. Really nice artwork there from the Polish astronomer Hevelius. If you look down there at the bottom, Taurus the Bull, Zodiacal Constellations, lecture number Z3, Z is in Zodiac. If we flip it over, we find our buddy Hubert again, we find the five other recordings from the series, and then the series of uh, objects they talk about in the record. Uh, Taurus contains a couple of star clusters, uh, a nebula, the leftovers from a uh, dead star, uh, some interesting kinds of variable stars. And again, during the course of the talk, they also dipped into astrology a little bit. He talked a little bit about, oh, here's one example of a horoscope for horoscope for Taurus. And then here's an example of another one that actually conflicts with it. So it was a, uh, it was a, a wide, diverse uh, sampling of content. And I think that's what really uh, helped this go so far. Now, I will tell you, you will not find this on the internet. I have found absolutely nothing about this second planetarium lecture series other than this one copy of this Taurus record that I have. I went digging into copyright and in 1973, Hubert Bernard trademarked his Taurus lecture for production for this, uh, but he didn't trademark any other Zodiac lectures. So I don't know what happened with this. Maybe they made one and it flopped and so they canceled the rest of the series. Maybe they realized that some of the other Zodiac constellations aren't as full of cool things as Taurus. Who knows? But we're not done yet. One more record going back even earlier. And I'm not going to talk about this too much because Bing is going to touch on this uh, just after I'm done. But this is the Vortex audiovisual performance series that took place also at the Morrison Planetarium in San Francisco from 1957 to 1959. And this one I do want to show you because um, everything else we've shown is just kind of like boring black vinyl, nothing, no big deal. Uh, this was actually a repress of the original Voyager of the original Vortex record that came out a couple years ago. 400 copies, nice crystal clear vinyl. And what I absolutely love is the B side label, which is actually a model of the sound system in the old Morrison Planetarium. They had speaker arrays completely surrounding the room, and then two more speakers in the middle of the room by the star projector that could be fed by a separate audio source. But again, I don't want to tell you too much about Vortex. I'm going to let Bing take uh, take care of that. Again, my name is Mike Smale. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me. Feel free to hit me up on my, uh, Twitter. My handle's below. Uh, I'm also going to hop over to YouTube and Facebook and take a look at the comments there, see if there's any questions. Uh, thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of Nightlife. Mike, that was fascinating. I saw in the comments you've inspired a lot of people to go check out Planetarium Music on YouTube. To those brave souls, all I can say is good luck and Godspeed. But, Bing, you've got some cool stuff to tell us about Vortex. What is Vortex? What can we learn? Well, Mike introduced the uh, topic of Vortex, and Vortex was the world's, by all accounts, the world's first planetarium light show. And it came out in uh, 1957. And that's when the, the planetarium was still relatively new. It opened up in 1952. And it was a very unique thing that people hadn't quite seen before because it was a theater in the round. People faced the center of the room. And uh, a couple of people, Jordan Belson and uh, Henry Jacobs, uh, Henry Jacobs was a sound engineer, um, were really fascinated by the medium. So not only did they love the planetarium star project, but they love the round environment. And what they did was they decided to, to try to make use of the medium. And they thought that uh, the, the, the medium itself could be part of the presentation. They came up with um, a, a very interesting uh, way to use the sound system of the planetarium. At, at, in 1957, Morrison was one of the more advanced planetariums in the world. And here's the record that Mike showed you. There were actually several of these, several presentations of Vortex. So the soundtrack changed a little bit each time. Here are uh, Jordan Belson and Henry Jacobs. And uh, they, they went to the planetarium. They looked at the distribution of speakers, and Mike showed this. This is the label of one of the records. And there were 12 stations of three speakers. So 12 clusters plus two others 
at the very top of the dome and two other bass speakers along the edge. But by developing a special control like a hand crank, they could channel all the sound to one of those stations only. And not only that, they could move that sound around. So they could have the sound rotate around the audience and create what they called the vortex effect. And that was a, a, a spinning vortex of sound around the audience. And to accompany that, Jordan Belson developed a lot of visuals that had a very radial sort of orientation. They came out from the top of the dome. Back in 1957, the planetarium was different from the one that people might be familiar with today. It wasn't tilted. It was a slightly smaller dome. It was 65 feet across. And so people looked straight up at uh, the images. And Belson designed these images. You can see those two little uh, mushroom-like things on tall stalks coming off the big star projector. Those kinds of projectors created imagery that seemed to radiate from the top of the dome and slide down the sides. The planetarium dome was a perfect frameless canvas that had no reference points that people could see, and it would make people feel that they were floating in space looking at these strange abstract images, which were mostly spirals, mandalas, um, other types of patterns. Um, in that 1957, were, this must have been In 1957, it was amazing. And uh, this only gives a hint. Now, the images themselves were too faint to register on film, so there's no film record of the actual imagery of a vortex show. However, Jordan Belson developed a, a short film called Allures, which had some of the components of the concepts he used in vortex. So this will give you just a brief taste of uh, what the of, of Vortex show was like. That with the soundtrack, which was at the time, in 1957, what they called electronic music. And it's what Henry Jacobs called mostly bloops and bleeps and early rock and roll Sputnik influenced stuff. At the time, <laughs> tape recorders were also new. So one of the things that Henry Jacobs did was he could create loops of sound and took natural sounds, other uh, sounds that you could just hear, every, water drips, uh, all sorts of things. And he made loops of those. And they just rotated around and around. And he, he rotated the sound around. And it was a very, very interesting experience for that time. Uh, the Vortex shows that were shown from 1957 to 1959 were extremely popular. They drew huge audiences that the, the administration of the museum wasn't quite ready for. And uh, they, they, they actually... Um, thought that these were very strange people who weren't interested in science. They were more interested in the artistic experience, and they were described as bohemians who smoke funny cigarettes outside the, the walls of the, the museum in while Golden they waited Gate to get Park. in. Ooh, in Golden Gate thought? Park. Uh, but it was a tremendous success, and uh, after a while, uh, Belson and, and Jacobs got, uh, they, they went their separate ways. They tried taking the show up to Canada. They took it to Brussels for a little while to the World's Fair. Uh, and uh, then they, they decided to, to go uh, on separate paths after that. But in 1974, one of the assistants who worked with Belson and Jacobs uh, named David Barrazzo tried to revive Vortex. So he and Doug McKechnie, who was uh, an electronic musician, uh, try, they, they proposed this idea, and according to Doug McKechnie, Jordan Belson gave them th his blessing. Uh, they came up with a, a second version of Vortex, which did many of the similar types of visuals that were used, only this time the soundtrack was real music. Doug McKechnie composed music on a Moog synthesizer. He used a few other pieces, introduced Tomita to many audiences, and so the music was much more melodic and wasn't just a lot of noise and bleeps and bloops. And so uh, this is a shot taken during one of those shows in 1974. Uh, I, I had the privilege of, of being an usher at the planetarium at the time. And all the shows were, were sold out. They were all full. And uh, I think they were very much in the same spirit as the original shows. Of course, right after that engagement of Vortex, um, then a new kind of light show came around that used not incandescent lights, but lasers. And that was Laserium, which the planetarium had on and off from uh, 1974 through 2000. That changed the whole face of the light show industry and, and planetariums. Um, and now we have Vortex 2.0, which Connor is going to talk about. 
And this takes a, another leap forward in the visualization of music. We went from incandescent effects and simple mores to lasers, now to computer graphics, which are so complicated and so beautiful and colorful, uh, you're gonna get a little taste of that from Connor. So that's sort of a, a brief nutshell history of Vortex, which is uh, really fascinating. And it's, it's really neat that here at Morrison Planetarium, we had the very first such abstract light show in a planetarium in the world. Very cool. That's a wonderful piece of history to share, Bing. Thank you so much for sharing your personal connection too. Sure thing. We had a parting shot from Mike saying that we have to mention that both founders were in fact from Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but they lived in San Francisco, Mike. And I do think it's very cool coming back to Mike's presentation about sending those lectures home is kind of replicating what we're doing right now, trying to bring astronomy content to people at their house just a little bit before the present day. Well, thank you again, Bing. Sure thing. Have a great night. Okay, so we had a teaser for Vortex 2.0, and we're not just going to tease you. We're actually going to get a chance to see a little bit of Vortex 2.0, care of one of the artists, Connor, a.k.a. Bedtimes. He's going to be taking us through a VR tour of 360 imagery that's being piloted by him for us to look at on our flat screens at home. This is designed for an immersive media, maybe like a VR headset or a planetarium. So putting it on a flat screen takes a little bit of guidance. So he will be piloting us throughout. Okay, Connor, take it away.
Hello, am I on? Yeah. Hi, my name is Connor. Um, I'm the director and lead artist for uh, that uh, Shigeto VR piece. Um, it was originally a VR piece that with the coordination of the Cal Academy of Sciences, we turned into a planetarium piece, which is on hold currently. But um, I also had the pleasure of designing um, the and organizing the Vortex 2.0 show, which has a completely original soundtrack. It's pretty fun. I encourage people to see it once things open up again. Um, what you guys saw um, was inspired a lot by um, my fascination with not only evolutionary biology, but early Earth history. And I'm forgetting names right now, but um, <clears throat> someone touched on a protoplanetary disk a bit, and that's kind of related to what inspired this piece. Um, this is kind of the story of a memory of a planet. Diana, yes, Diana. And I hope that Diana weighs in on what I'm saying because you got to hear from an expert and you're about to hear from an enthusiast. Um, but this piece was uh, inspired in part by the story or one theory of how water came to Earth through asteroids and comets that had ice on them. And I thought that was fascinating. And this kind of tells the story of a planet through an extinction event before and after um, around a human-like civilization that has reached like kind of a kind of like a peak, I guess. And um, so not only is it inspired by the story of how water comes to the planet, but it's kind of like looking at these extinction events in Earth's history. Um, for example, like if humanity was a part of like, if Earth's history was a giant book, then humanity is like a period on the last sentence of the last chapter of the book. And in history, entire chapters have been devoted towards like proto shrimp and crabs um, that have become apex um, species on the planet for millions of years, far longer than we've been around. And they ate themselves to extinction or um, an extinction event happened and life kind of reset on the planet. And their reign was very long and it's sometimes destructive. And that has made me look a lot at um, humanity and our role in history, I guess our legacy we're going to leave. And I've started to think a lot about, you know, what our purpose and what our focus in sciences should be. Um, and I think those questions are becoming a lot more important right now. Um, we're a lot more uh, intelligent than crabs and early shrimp. So I think that we can do better. Um, but it's kind of a humbling experience to research evolutionary, bio evolutionary biology and to look at um, those imprints in history and how insignificant they were at some times. Um, but I know that Diana is gonna talk about how water came from a protoplanetary disk, uh, Earth's protoplanetary disk and the hydrogen there. But um, I think maybe she can uh, leave some comments on what she thinks about um, the uh, asteroid theory. But I actually have a little uh, treat as um, uh, the past, I think Mike was presenting, talking about the planetarium show, which I feel like I should talk about a little bit, but I don't know where to start because that was a really fun experience. Um, I didn't know about the Black Hole uh, album, um, but I have a little treat. I have the Black Hole pop-up book. Ooh. <laughs> Is this science? <laughs> but um, I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, uh, that, I guess, um, oh, right, we're going to go into the making of, right, that's what we're going to do. We sh I should set that up. Um, there are a lot of fun techniques used in the Shigeto VR piece, um, because actually I originated as a practical effects artist, um, inspired by a lot of the artists of the 50s and 60s and 70s that didn't have the advanced computer technology that I use today. Um, and earlier in my career, I relied on that a lot. I was really inspired by using physical elements, creating effects using um, chemical reactions, smoke, uh, fire, water, light, um, that, sorts of, that sort of thing. Um, and on my website, you'll see a lot of those kind of buried in there, but it's still kind of like my roots. Um, so uh, in the creation of this piece, I scanned a lot of real world objects, painted rocks that looked like asteroids, turned them into 3D objects, into asteroids in 3D. Um, I used software that used, um, like a process that's kind of like using noise to create natural landscapes and then um, kind of these 
softwares for landscapes have like natural erosion uh, time scale settings that you can use to kind of make realistic landscapes. And in the piece, you'll see that the glowing white liquid throughout is water that kind of has like a dual sided, like destructive force, but also a life giving force in it. Um, so I try to use as many like natural process processes as possible in the creation of this digital piece. Um, we recorded a lot of, uh, um, I w and you should really check it in VR or in the planetarium. You can look around. There's a lot of textures that are moving. That's actual chemical reactions that we filmed. Try to make it look like that primordial ooze on the planet because the, the piece like jumps back and forth in history a lot. But um, I I'll kind of like narrate as we watch it, but we can start that now if you guys have it up. Okay, I'm unmuted now. So what you saw was um, uh, me, I took this rock that I got from a hike. It's actually kind of like a big thing I love about making art is that I capture a lot of sounds and, and models from the real world and they all have memories associated with it. This is a rock, I've, the two rocks I found on a hike in the Redwoods. And um, I painted them white and I used a process called photogrammetry in which you take a bunch of photos of it, it makes a point cloud of it, it makes a 3D mesh and a texture, and I brought that into a 3D rendering software, as you can see here. And this is how I made the asteroid, the icy asteroid. And you'll see me kind of lighting it um, and putting it together. And a lot of this is inspired by, at the time, there were these, uh, there was these uh, photographs of, uh, of an asteroid that um, uh, they had taken these beautiful hollowing, like uh, kind of eerie black and white photographs of asteroids. This is a now defunct software um, that I used to use uh, called World Creator that you can actually like through a series of nodes program uh, a landscape and then use things like time and erosion and water to sculpt the landscape in a natural way, which really served the purpose of the story well. You'll see that happening. And I really should have shown more, but the worst, my weakest point is actually presenting my work. It's, I'm better at making it than showing it off, so I just did like a quick, threw it together in, the, in, the, in 3D here and you'll see one of the landscapes um, coming to life and then popping into a panoramic VR view at some point. Here we go, yeah, it's 360 view, all the elements put together. Hey. And that's uh, that's 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 kind of it. I'm happy to take questions or comments or or whatever at this point, um, if that's a thing. Didn't see any questions. Okay, cool. That's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, that's uh, pretty much all I got. Connor, that was fascinating. It is so cool to see how a show that I've only experienced in our dome comes together, how it turns into the product we see. And for those of you who thought this was cool, it is cool. It is beautiful to watch. But until you're seeing this in an immersive environment, you're just getting part of the picture. It is so awesome to fly through those scapes from a dome or I imagine a VR headset too. One of the really cool things about that environment is it removes the self, kind of like Bing was talking about. You do feel like you're floating. You're free of your spatial considerations. You could be huge. You could be really small. And you're just taking this scenery in from a non-human perspective. Absolutely fascinating. So thank you, Connor, for making such a wonderful piece. We do still periodically feature Vortex 2.0 at our nightlife events. So if we're back at the Academy and nightlife is happening and you come to one of those, you can really see that same piece in a much more immersive environment than our average home theater. Okay, but with that, I think we are through most of our evening's programming. I would love to thank all of you, our viewers, for tuning in, for watching, and for making us feel loved even when we don't have our museum to back us up. 
And big thank you to our presenters as well for sharing their wonderful uh, presentations with us, but also their expertise and their commentary on the really cool stuff we saw. If you want to follow them on Twitter or Instagram, their links should be available right below their names if you backtrack the video. Next week, we're going to have a night school, epidemics and ecosystems with a little bit of a different lens on the COVID-19 pandemic from the Academy's own Dr. Shannon Bennett, researcher of viruses extraordinaire. She really knows her stuff. And she can tell us some wonderful things about this virus, which is occupying an awful lot of our perspectives these days. We also have Dr. Peter Rupnarine, one of my personal favorite researchers, a paleontologist who studies ecosystems that are extinct, and he has some fascinating stuff to share. And if you enjoyed tonight's programs, in two weeks, we're going to have another night school, which is celestial again, but this time celestial wayfinding. You can learn about indigenous systems of navigation and orientation from Kalepa Bebeyan, as well as Emily Peavy from the Imaloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii. So with that, thank you all for tuning in. If you want to catch more content from us at the Academy, subscribe to our channel. We are doing our very best to share that museum experience with you at home. And from myself, the Morrison team, and all of our partners, thank you for joining us. Stay happy, stay healthy, have a wonderful evening. We'll see you soon.